Uh, buongiorno a tutti. Il mio nome è Jeffrey Newton e sono un vice presidente del MIT. Hello, my name is Jeffrey Newton and I'm a vice president of MIT. È un vero piacere dare a tutti voi il benvenuto al MIT. E specialmente a coloro i quali hanno viaggiato da grande distanza per essere qui con noi. È un privilegio per me presentarvi un artista il cui talento musicale porta gioia alle persone di tutto il mondo. Egli è tuttavia anche un grande visionario. He is, however, a great visionary as well. Egli ha dedicato molto del suo tempo e del suo impegno tramite la sua fondazione ad affrontare quelle problematiche che colpiscono coloro che vivono sfide quali la cecità e la povertà. Questa è la ragione per cui noi siamo qui oggi. He has dedicated much of his time and effort through his foundation to address issues affecting people who struggle with challenges, such as blindness and poverty. He is the reason we are here today. Diamo il nostro benvenuto. Please help me welcome to MIT, Maestro Andrea Bocelli. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to speak in English for you, but uh, mm, I think my English is not enough. And then uh, today, also many people in Italy are listening to us. So I prefer uh, to speak in my language. And, uh, and I thank uh, Maria Galletta that will translate for me. Innanzitutto voglio ringraziare tutti voi di questa presenza, della, della vostra presenza e dell'attenzione che mi dedicherete. First of all, I would like to thank you all for being here and for the attention you will devote to me. E voglio ringraziare tutte le università italiane che hanno prestato il loro eh, lavoro eh, per questo per questa idea, per questo progetto. And I would like to thank all of the Italian universities that devoted their time and effort to this uh, project. Um, tra le altre voglio ringraziare in particolare l'Università di Palermo, l'Università di Firenze, di Venezia e la Bicocca di Milano. In particular, I'd like to thank the University in Palermo, in Firenze, in Venice and la Bicocca in Milan. Non so se ho dimenticato la mia, quella della mia città, Pisa, e Sant'Anna anche. And I think I forgot the one in my city, Pisa, <coughs> Sant'Anna. Bene. Detto questo, provate a immaginare un bambino di sei anni all'età di andare a scuola. So, at this point, try to imagine a kid, about six years old, about to go to school. Che preso dal, dai, dal suo piccolo paese, dai campi, dai prati dove ha giocato fino al giorno prima, viene portato lontano da casa in un collegio dove inizia, inizia il suo percorso di studi. And try to think of this kid that all he's known has been his little town, the fields outside where he's playing, and he is taken to a boarding school far away. In questo collegio incontra quella che è la prima autorità che si incontra fuori dalla famiglia, dopo quella dei genitori che è la maestra, no? And he meets the first person of authority outside the family that a kid ever that meets, um, the, the teacher, the school teacher. 
e lì inizia a interrogarsi su quello che sarà il suo percorso scolastico. E lì inizia a chiedere cosa la vita in scuola sarà come. Così in breve tempo saprà che dopo eh, la scuola elementare, in Italia abbiamo cinque anni di scuola elementare, affronterà poi le scuole medie dopo la, dove dopo la sua maestra eh, invece conoscerà eh, i professori. E poi imparerà che dopo cinque anni di elementare, come facciamo in Italia, va alla scuola media e a quel punto non avrà solo un insegnante, ma avrà molti insegnanti. A Dio piacendo, dopo queste scuole affronterà poi le scuole superiori dove troverà professori ancora più importanti. E poi, se tutto va bene, dopo questo, andrà a scuola più high school e avrà altri professori lì che lo aiuteranno a tackle ancora più importanti studi. Così il bambino inizia a immaginare, guardando sempre più alto, immaginare queste persone in un cielo sempre più alto. No? So the kid starts realizing that uh, things will progress and will go higher and higher. E come tutti i bambini che non si accontentano mai, la cui curiosità galoppa sempre, comincia a domandarsi cosa ci sarà dopo di questo. And as every kid, you know, every kid is very curious, he will wonder what's going to happen after all this. E scopre che dopo, dopo, di, dopo questo percorso arriverà finalmente in un'altra scuola che si chiama Università, dove ci saranno dei professori ancora più importanti. E poi imparerà che dopo tutto questo andrà a un tipo di scuola ancora più alto, che si chiama Università, dove avrà bisogno di altri professori che sono ancora più importanti di quelli che ha incontrato fino ad ora. Il bambino chiede poi e cosa ci sarà dopo di questo. E poi il bambino continua a chiedere cosa succederà dopo questo. Nel mondo dello scibile, dopo di questo, ci, saranno, ci sono gli scienziati, gli uomini di scienza, coloro che, sulle cui spalle l'umanità procede. Dopo questo, ci sono gli scolari, i scientisti, quelli che continuano la conoscenza e andare più profondo. Noi oggi ci troviamo in una di, delle più importanti università del mondo, in mezzo a tanti scienziati. E oggi siamo qui, in una delle più importanti università del mondo, con molti scienziati. In un luogo in cui questo bambino, eh, in un luogo che questo bambino immaginava proprio subito sotto le stelle, insomma. E questo è un posto che il bambino che vi stavo parlando prima vorrebbe immaginare essere così vicino alle stelle, you know, veramente al top di tutto. Beh, avrete capito che il bambino nella fattispecie ero io. Quindi sono sicuro che ora il bambino che vi stavo parlando era me. E lo scenario che mi sta di fronte siete voi, cari professori e cari scienziati. E quello che stavo considerando siete voi, professori, scienziati e scolari. Allora, chi mi dà la forza, l'ardire di, di prendere questo microfono e parlarvi? Questa forza mi viene dalla convinzione di vivere con voi un'idea, una grande idea. Well, this strength of holding this microphone comes to me from the conviction that I am actually sharing with you a great idea. Goethe diceva appunto vivere nell'idea significa considerare possibile tutto quello che apparentemente è impossibile. Goethe, 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 Goethe used to say uh, living an idea means to consider possible everything that at first would seem to be impossible. E noi siamo oggi in questa situazione, eh, quella di vivere tutti assieme un'idea, un sogno, un progetto. E questa è la situazione che abbiamo tutti shared oggi, living all together an idea a dream, a project. Un'idea, un sogno, un progetto che è nata, 
che sono nati proprio qui a Boston, uh, direi due o tre anni fa, non so. And I'm talking about an idea, a dream and a project that were born exactly here in Boston two or three years ago. Quando mh, alla fine di un concerto ho avuto il piacere di incontrare eh, il professor Munzer. When at the end of a concert I had the pleasure of meeting professor Munzer. Col quale ho iniziato a parlare e che mi ha dato in un certo senso l'ispirazione per chiedergli se fosse possibile immaginare un percorso che portasse alla realizzazione di uno strumento che definirei miracoloso, atto a risolvere dalle radici la difficoltà di base di tutti coloro che non vedono. E questo mi ha me to uh, ask him if it would ever be possible to imagine the production of a device, uh, a wonderful device, that would make uh, the, uh, would meet the very basic need of people that at this point are not able to do certain things. Da poco era nata la mia fondazione, uh, la fondazione che porta il mio nome, My foundation had been created just shortly before that, the foundation that carries my name. Uh, Un'iniziativa che era nata, che è nata da una riflessione, da un'analisi della realtà che ci circonda. And this initiative was born out of the analysis of the reality uh, that we have all around us. Una riflessione, un'analisi che suggeriscono il fatto, la considerazione che oggi la povertà non è un fenomeno che sta soltanto nascosto dietro lo schermo di un televisore o sulle pagine dei giornali. E questa uh, riflessione ci uh, ha portato a considerare che la povertà nowadays è not a fenomeno che è solo nascosto behind the screen of a TV or in the pages of a newspaper. È un fenomeno che ahimè eh, si fa sempre più concreto ogni giorno e bussa alla porta delle nostre case. It's something that it's concrete and knocks on the doors of our homes. Mm, ecco perché ho pensato che fosse tempo e fosse estremamente necessario Uh, far nascere una, una, una fondazione, un'iniziativa che mirasse a combattere con tutti gli strumenti a, nostro uh, a nostra disposizione questo annoso problema. E è per questo che ho pensato che era il tempo di cercare e risolvere con questa fondazione Um, some of the issues that we have so that we can fight with all the tools that we have available. Quella sera qui a Boston ho creduto, ho ritenuto di leggere nel, uh, nel professor Munzer e non solo in lui una, un, un reale entusiasmo per questa idea. In that evening here in Boston I was really able to gather during the meeting with Professor Munzer and, and other people, a real enthusiasm uh, in regards to this idea. L'idea è appunto una scommessa, una scommessa enorme, quella di sfidare la, la natura in un certo senso e creare uno strumento che si sostituisca in tutto all'occhio. The idea was really a huge bet. Uh, it was the idea of defying nature and create a tool, a device, that would basically substitute itself to the eyes. La, la risposta che mi è sembrato di intuire dal, dal professore e da tutti coloro che in seguito hanno iniziato a lavorare su questo progetto è, si potrebbe riassumere con una frase che è diventata così popolare in questo paese da qualche anno ed è Yes, we can. <laughs> And the answer that I 
thought I, I, I got from Professor Munzer and, and the others that were there that night uh, can be summarized in, an, in, an, uh, in a sentence that has been very popular in the past few years in this country. Yes, we can. Allora uh, è iniziato questa, questa corsa, questo cammino importante. And so that's how we started this very important journey together. Uh, ora la parola aspetta a loro, a voi, agli scienziati. Now the floor is theirs. They have the ones that have to work on this. Ai quali io cedo volentieri la, la parola. And I give them the floor. E dai quali auguro dal profondo del cuore buon lavoro. And I wish them from the uh, deep of my heart uh, to have a very fruitful uh, working session. Ai quali auguro di riuscire nel più breve tempo possibile a, re a realizzare una cosa uh, per, per la quale a loro verrà da ogni angolo del mondo un sentitissimo grazie. And I wish them to be able in the shortest possible time to do something that uh, will uh, make it so that from all over the world uh, there will be a very deep thank you that goes to them. Thank you very much. Now I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Borale, uh, the pro-rector of the University of Pisa. Thank you. Thank you, President. Uh, I am pleased uh, and honored uh, to attend to this meeting. Last year, I participated to a meeting organized by Bocelli Foundation in Pisa. And the scientific uh, presentation were exciting. And also the um, very interesting were the proposals of uh, innovation presented by young researchers of Pisa University. In the present meeting, many scientists uh, came from various uh, Italian universities and cover important areas differently connected uh, with vision impairment and uh, recovery. But uh, as a vice uh, Director of Pisa University for Research, I like to, to welcome the contribution not only from of uh, scientists from Pisa, but also from Florence, uh, Venice, uh, Milan, and uh, uh, Palermo, uh, making greater the contribution of Italian University to this field so 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 well supported by. Uh, Bocelli Foundation. But uh, uh, I also take the uh, opportunity to underline the interest of Pisa University to develop uh, fruitful collaboration with MIT in other areas. Uh, the collaboration, this collaboration start uh, last year and allowed uh, the exchanges between 12 outstanding uh, young researchers from Pisa and uh, um, MIT in different fields. And one of these uh, field uh, uh, was regarding a project in uh, engineer engineering informatics um, aimed at for assisting technology for students with uh, disabilities. This has been carried out with uh, uh, mm, Dr. Teller. Uh, this year, now, we have selected uh, additional five excellent researchers in different fields, such as ecology, uh, applied geology, and so on. Uh, until now, uh, University of Pisa has provided uh, its own resources, about uh, $150,000 last year, and we will... Uh, uh, we will put the same amount uh, of money this year to, to, to confirm our intention to, to this collaboration and uh, we hope uh, in the next year to increase uh, uh, 
uh, th this amount of money to further support the collaboration between uh, Pisa University and MIT. So now I, I conclude wishing you a very fruitful and interesting meeting. Thank you very much. And I'd like to introduce Professor uh, Laura Geray, who will make a few opening comments on the workshop. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Cambridge. Good morning to everybody here in America and in Italy. My name is Laura Gerre. I am the scientific coordinator for the Andrea Bocelli Foundation and also the chair of this workshop. And uh, on, be uh, on behalf of ABF, I wish to welcome all the Italian and American scientists, neuroscientists, psychologists, and engineers who have accepted the ABF and MIT invitation in the year of uh, the Italian culture in USA. And they are here to answer to this important question. Can neuroscience and technology help blind people in achieving a more independent life? Before I start with my uh, speech, I have to uh, put myself in big shoes. I have big shoes to fill because the uh, director of the Scuola Superiore Sant'Anna asked me to uh, give, uh, uh, on behalf of the Scuola Superiore Sant'Anna, his remark. So now I'm reading on his uh, uh, name. On behalf of the Scuola Superiore Sant'Anna, I would like to express my warmest greetings and um, wish you a successful workshop. Please extend my wishes to the maestro, the organizer, our colleagues, and to everybody involved in the second workshop promoted by the Andrea Bocelli Foundation. With connects, uh, what connects the Scuola Superiore Sant'Anna in the city of Pisa, which hosted the first workshop, to MIT here in Boston, it is not only the works that will be discussed over the next few days, which I myself will take part in remotely from Italy, most importantly, it stems from the wish to ensure that scientific research does everything possible to overcome the barriers imposed by physical limitations. Now I go back to my role, <laughs> and I want to describe briefly the aim of this workshop. I'm here to briefly introduce this workshop with its multidisciplinary flavor. Researchers will show a variety of different approaches to enabling greater independence and social particip participation among blind people, and we will try to achieve together a new multidisciplinary understanding. I will start this day reading a short story. John is a blind boy who is 20 years old, is attending college and would like to graduate, find friends, a lot of friends, and then find an interesting job. John lives in a city and takes the subway to go to college. John has a system of sensor, a pair of glasses reading for him, the text around, notifying him the direction of the subway and which train and line he has to take, a device on his wrist that tells him with small pressures what is the path he should follow. Once his phone has been loaded automatically with updated maps of the place where he is. While waiting for the subway, the glasses and the small cameras are looking at the surroundings, capturing the scene and communicating with the database on the phone. Through the touch screen kept in his pocket, now they are telling him that Mary is approaching with a book in her hands. Mary is a beautiful girl, the prettiest student in his class. John really likes her. She is as tall as he is and blonde, and she has a smile and a voice killing him. John goes towards her and greets her by saying, Hello, I saw that you are reading Pascal. Is this the pensée? So he can catch her attention because, for the first time, she noticed that it was not her to go closer to him, and also because he starts talking about her book and its title. John begins the talk about the book, about Pascal and his vision of the world, and John, deep inside, is very grateful to his uh, text recognizer and his devices that are helping him. 
While they were speaking, John noticed a guy coming. He knows he's interested in Mary. John has also a system that communicates facial expressions of people close by. And because of that, in addition to his sensitivity, which has always captured small subtle, subtle differences in the voice of whom is in front of him, he realized that the attention of Mary was caught by this other person and that she has turned her head toward the man who is coming. John is concerned. He would like to do something to let her attention return back to himself. And so he takes and squeezes her hand communicating by touch all his love. <laughs> Mary does not know that John owns a lot of technological aids helping him, strengthening its perceptual capabilities because they are hidden. Mary knows that he is blind since the first time she met him, but the only thing that matters to her is that she knows deeply inside how much she likes him and that she has always liked him for his intelligence intelligence and his smile that melts her soul and for his warm voice. She does not know anything about the gadget he's carrying around, and she does not care. But honest, honestly, today, when he approached her, initiated the conversation, and talked about this book, she was really impressed by how natural and simple this was for him. John is a lucky guy, not because he has devices helping him, but because he has met Mary, the right woman for his life. Let's start the work of this day dedica dedicated to all the Johns around the world that are looking for their Marys to meet, for, to meet for a good job and for a more independent life to enjoy. Now, Professor Seth Teller from MIT will give the presentation on the MIT Fifth Sense project that the Andrea Bocelli Foundation has founded the last two years. Please, Seth. Good morning. Thank you, Laura, Andrea, Jeff, Rector. Welcome, everybody. Uh, I want to start by thanking the Andrea Bocelli Foundation, Andrea and his family personally, for their support for the, some of the work that I'll be telling you about today. In fact, my lab has been working for more than a decade to develop devices to help people who are blind, or visually impaired or situationally impaired gain access to information about their surroundings. And so we are extremely grateful not only for the support of the foundation, as I mentioned, but also for Munzer Ndale and his, uh, the connection that he made between uh, the Bocellis and, and our work. I also want to acknowledge my collaborators, Professor Keller, Carol Livermore and Rob Miller, and the others listed here. You'll be hearing from Carol later uh, this morning, in fact, as part of uh, my talk. Let me say a little bit about uh, my background and what sort of things happen in my lab. Our central focus is making machines that are useful and that can do useful things for people. And those machines come in two forms. At the top, you see a variety of robots. These are machines that can move their bodies around and do physical work for the user, cars that can drive themselves around with you as a passenger, forklifts that can move freight or other materials around at the command of a human, wheelchairs that can drive occupants around 
and manipulate objects in the environment with a limb and a hand. And most recently, a humanoid robot there at the right that someday will be able to walk into a place like Fukushima after a disaster and do useful work there, hook up a, a pump or open a valve or move a control rod. The second type of machines that we develop are also computational. They don't move their bodies around by themselves, but they are rather worn or carried by a person. And their job is to provide information to that person, information about the person's surroundings, how people are oriented in space, who's nearby, and so forth. And I'll tell you a lot more about that in the next half hour or so. You've already heard the name of the Fifth Sense Project. And the goal really is, this, is the same dream that Andrea mentioned, which is to develop some sort of portable, wearable device that enables blind and visually impaired people to live, study, work independently, to do whatever they wish to do on their own terms. And we call this the Fifth Sense Project because it does replace the missing or impaired sense of vision. And in more detail in a few minutes, I'll go through the four key visual functions that we are now seeking to augment or supply through the development of these devices. And these are functions that we've learned about through years of working with people who live with blindness or visual impairment. One basic one is mobility, just moving your body safely from point A to point B. Another one is knowing about your social context, who's around you. A third one is knowing about the textual or the symbolic environment around you. The world is filled with text and symbols, and we all want access to those things. And finally, people want a way to learn about all that information privately and discreetly, and quickly enough so that it can be useful to them in the pursuit of whatever they're doing at the moment. So let me start by uh, talking a little bit about our work on safe mobility and orientation. And this is something that's spearheaded by Rahul uh, Namdev, who's a PhD student working with me. We all know that we're out in the world walking around. The world is full of hazards. It's also full of safe places to walk. But look at the, the images I've, I've arrayed here. We've got, we've got uh, smooth terrain here over on the left. We've got a crosswalk, which is a recommended place to cross the street, a curb cut where the sidewalk uh, slopes down toward the street, some stairs that might ascend or drop off in front of you, uh, more subtle things like thresholds or, or ir irregularities in the floor surface that are trip hazards. Here's another one here, quite common in Cambridge. I'm not sure you have these tree stumps growing out of the ground in Pisa. Um, transient obstacles like restaurant signs, uh, curbs that might be 10 or 15 centimeters tall, poles that one can walk into, or even hit one's head on in the case of things that are suspended at head height over the ground. And also transitions in surface type between outdoors, things like concrete and grass or asphalt, and indoors, things like tile and carpet. And to move safely in a world that is full of these kinds of hazards that appear in both structured and unstructured ways, one needs a device that can capture relevant information about the walkable terrain and deliver it to the user. And as, I th as people uh, saw in the images and heard in my description of the images, these hazards can be complex. They can be small. They can be hard to detect. Uh, there is a, a, a precision requirement that the information has to be delivered in a way so that the user can actually act so as to avoid the hazard. For example, to slow down or to take another route. And it must be delivered quickly enough to support fluid 
mobility. People want to get where they want to get efficiently, not to move slowly through the world. This must work indoors and outdoors, and it must meet many size, weight, and power limits. We don't want to carry a giant piece of hardware around to solve this problem. And this is a good point to comment on something uh, Andrea mentioned earlier about uh, going from the impossible to the possible. So I think what you'll hear from us today and from many of the other presenters are ideas about things that were impossible a few decades ago. They were impossible because of limitations in available sensors impossible because of limitations in available computational devices. And what we are all trying to do is go from capabilities that were impossible decades ago to are at least possible, at least in principle today, and to go from capabilities that are possible in principle to possible and practical. And finally, to go from possible and practical to possible, practical and usable by real people, and finally to go to devices that are affordable. That is a very long and demanding list of requirements. And I think it's fair to say we're early on the road to satisfying all of those requirements. But the road has to start somewhere. So as you see some of the things I show you, please use your imagination and imagine that the march of technology will ease some of, these limit some of the limitations in what I show you today, just through the natural progression of computers getting faster, sensors getting smaller and more powerful, interfaces getting more flexible, and so forth. All right, let me come back to the mobility and orientation. What are we doing? to tackle this problem? Well, we're attaching to the user's body or letting the user carry a package of sensors that captures stereo information, just as you get from your human visual system from a pair of eyes, binocular stereo. LiDAR information, which is like stereo but uses an infrared laser to illuminate the scene and then measures the distance to things in the scene using the laser and inertial information, which measures how the sensor is moving in space or, or rotating in space as the user walks. We're fusing this data over short time scales of a couple of seconds and maintaining a map of the local surroundings and then analyzing that map to find the sorts of hazards that I discussed earlier. Safe, certainly safe walking areas, but also vertical surfaces that you could walk into, uh, drop-offs, ascents, and even changes in visual texture, as I mentioned before, that could indicate uh, the risk of losing your footing as you move from one region to another. And we've spent some time uh, prototyping this capability in an indoor setting using a, a quite inexpensive sensor, which costs about 100 euros. And you can see in this color-coded image here, there's a a green region indicating safe walkable areas, a red uh, color indicating unsafe areas. And all of this is being computed in real time. Now, one might wonder, how is this information delivered to the user? And uh, clearly, it's not going to be delivered visually. There are a lot of possibilities it could be delivered through audio. Uh, we think the right way in the long run to deliver the information is through tactile stimulus, through the skin, and Carol will say more about that later today. Now, the, the uh, short clip I just showed you is, is just a prototype capability, it's, and the sensor we used is quite inexpensive, and in fact, we've concluded after many months of working with that sensor that it's simply not powerful enough to support a, to, to uh, be trusted with one's safety. There are more expensive and bulkier sensors that we've begun to experiment with that are better. So if uh, here uh, Rahul is holding a, a stereo sensor that costs more like 4,000 euros, it is heavy. It weighs a couple of kilos. It's something that we developed as a custom device with a company called Carnegie Robotics in Pittsburgh that makes sensor heads for robots. 
And this device can be carried in the hand, not very comfortably, or it can be worn on a front pack. And it can capture the same kind of information that I showed you a moment ago, but it can do so both indoors and outdoors, unlike the inexpensive sensor that can only work indoors. So here we see this uh, sensor operating outdoors and identifying smooth terrain in front of the user, obstacles that must be avoided. And of course, there's a visual aspect to the sensor as well. So the texture of the ground surface can be identified to find transitions between tiles and asphalt or grass and concrete and so forth. So th it's early days, and the sensor is too big, too heavy, and too expensive for us to expect anyone to use this today. But these sensors are getting smaller, computers are getting faster, and you'll see a 3D imaging capability like this in smartphones probably in less than five years. And we'll be able to exploit that same, the same sort of algorithms I've shown you and talked about to um, infer this sort of information about the environment. And the quality of this information can be quite high. Now I'm going to show you the same sensor running on an indoor scene and call your attention to the lower right quadrant where in real time with sufficient computational power a three-dimensional reconstruction of everything around you can be produced. This is live, running live on the sensor. So here's the image stream on the upper left, and I'm sorry this video is choppy because of the network connection. And on the lower right, this is a 3D reconstruction of what's around. And you can see how the same sort of information could be used to detect hazards in, the, um, in your surroundings. Uh, let me move on to the next uh, key function of vision, which is dynamic social context. This is this part of the effort is led by David Hayden, another PhD student who works with me and also with Professor Rob Miller. And the goal of this project is to provide access to blind people to information about their social surroundings. You're in a world full of people, but you can't see them. How do you detect acquaintances? Well, you can listen for them, the sound they make as they walk toward you or if they hail you, if they speak to you. But you can't engage them proactively. This is a significant limitation. If someone's coming toward you that you already, already know, you can't hail that person before he or she hails you. And we heard a little bit about that in the and the story about the, uh, the girl in the book. Similarly, with, a, with an unrecognized person, you'd like to know who's around you so that you can greet them or make contact. And you could be the first person to make contact. So the goal here is to develop a small body-worn device that can simply notify the user when people approach. If the approaching person is an acquaintance, Knowing that person's name would also be useful. And of course, you want this information fast enough to do something about it. If it comes 30 seconds after the person has walked by, it's not much of a help. So you really need it within about one or two seconds. So David has put together a couple of videos here. This one shows a full day of imagery taken at uh, three second intervals from a camera worn in his chest, sewn into his uh, chest, uh, chest of his jacket. There's a lot going on in this sequence. Everywhere he went, all the people that he encountered, all the conversations he had. There's a lot of data there. It's streaming constantly through the camera into the computer system. And to make things worse, the data is often blurred because 
you're moving around in the world, so your camera is moving. The camera is not pointing at anything in particular. It's not being aimed. It's just pointing wherever you happen to be going. So that means other people aren't viewed in a particular or dependable way. And as I mentioned, whatever information this thing does produce, it has to produce it quickly enough to be useful. And that means it must detect these encounters, as we call them, quite quickly. Moreover, the world is crowded with people. And in, in a room like this, maybe we, each of us knows just some of the folks. So we want to find a way to, to direct our computational effort just to the people we are likely to know. And we want to make the false positive rate acceptably low. That is, we don't want the uh, machine to make mistakes too often. There are additional requirements. This thing can't be a giant sensor that's worn on the body or worn on the head. It can't be obtrusive. It can't call attention to the user. It, it must be socially acceptable. It has to provide information privately. And it has to deliver information in a way that doesn't interrupt the social interactions that we all want to have anyway. And it has to work in a way that's accessible to blind and visually impaired users. So again, a very long list of requirements. Here's a picture of David wearing the prototype device. He's wearing a jacket with a small uh, smartphone sewn into the jacket. And peeking out of the jacket through a tiny hole about a centimeter across through a camera lens. There's a, uh, a watch with a button interface through which he can interact with this device. And there's a tiny speaker, or will be, in the jacket through which the device can whisper in his ear sotto voce when it wants to tell him about his social environment. So I've shown you the uh, video stream we capture. We also capture, capture inertial data, position information, whether outdoors or indoors, to understand where the uh, user is. And we run detection algorithms that look both for facial features, but also for body features. You can recognize people with a lot more than just their face. We can recognize people at a distance by their body shape, by their hairstyle, by their clothing, by their gait. There's also an element of spatial expectation in the encounters we expect in the world. In your apartment building in the morning, you expect to run in a to a certain set of people. While shopping at the market, you expect to run into a different set of people. At work, you expect to run in yet another into yet, yet another set of people. Well, we can incorporate that sort of spatial information into the system so that it makes better guesses about whom you're encountering. So we detect the approach of people. When they are recognized people, we inform the user of the identity. And if they are unrecognized people, those encounters are archived for later where the user can review them and tell the system, teach the system who that person was so that the next time the person is encountered, the system will be able to identify him or her. Here's that same video sequence I showed earlier, arrayed in, uh, across the top. And these uh, bars here are, show the amount of time total during the day that, that, that the user interacted with each of these people, not necessarily consecutively. So these are the sums of all the interactions that happened with this user and this, u this person and this person and this person and this person over the course of David's day, one recent day of David's. So here are a couple of uh, shots of the, of the system in action. I'll show you a couple of different use cases. One is in which an acquaintance approaches and the system detects the approach and notifies David. It's a little hard to see, but there's, he's wearing a watch here, and it's just a diagnostic display. It switches from person detection to Andrew. And it does it fast enough that he knows it's Andrew coming. Now, David plays it cool. He says, hey, how are you? 
He doesn't say, hey, Andrew, but he could have if he wanted to. Here's another use case. Uh, after this day of interactions is over, David can sit with the system and help it understand all the people that it missed during the day because it simply didn't have them in its database. We have nine social interactions with unknown people to review. An audio snippet of each interaction has been extracted around a time that each person was talking. Try to recognize their voice or remember based on the topic. Click the Do Not Add Person button if you don't expect to meet this person again. Click the Identify Person button and type in his or her name if you want your wearable assistant to identify this person in the future. Ready to begin? Begin button. Begin button. First interaction began Tuesday, 11.39 a.m. Lasted one minute's image of person. Audio. I am... Identify person. Do not add person. Button. Do not add person. Next interaction began Tuesday, 11:44 a.m. Lasted 62 minutes. Audio. Identify person. Identify person. Button. So there he entered the name of his friend Ross. Tuesday, 11:44 a.m. Lasted 61 minutes. Image. Audio. Sweet. Yeah. Okay. Identify person, but identify person, but next interaction began Tuesday, 12, 44 Okay, I think, PM I think you get the idea. And by, by reviewing these encounters, the system gets more capable. And the next time he encounters each of these folks that he just identified, he'll get the quiet notification as they approach. And uh, the, the folks that are familiar with the voiceover interface will notice that he was using a, a blind accessible interface to enter all that information. The third key function is access to the world of text and symbols around us, which is led by Dr. Nick Wang. He's a postdoc who's working with me. And these things, text and symbols, they're everywhere in the world. There are directories of building information. There are door plates with room numbers on them. There are uh, symbols indicating things like utility closets and bathrooms and so forth. There are transit signs with bus numbers and routes on them and entrance and exit signs. There are shopping uh, labels on products in stores and over, hanging over the aisles and at the end caps of the aisles. There are rules about how to use things in the world, like no dogs in the park or uh, what the hours are and so forth. And another major category of text and symbols is on appliances. We're f the world is full of appliances, and all of the, these appliances have interfaces. And the interfaces have text and symbols. Uh, here I'm showing an oven with some knobs and temperature settings uh, for the stovetop, uh, the oven control panel with a touch panel. Uh, the toaster, the thermostat, with a quite complex interface, in fact, to control heating and cooling and set times and temperature and all of this. Somewhat perversely, in recent years, these appliances have been getting less accessible to people without vision because these physical knobs have been replaced by inaccessible touchscreens, soft touchscreens that display information only visually. So we have to develop some way to get access to this kind of information from this portable device. And what are the challenges here? Well, as you saw, uh, text in the world appears with enormous variability. We don't know where it is in the world a priori, at what size it is, at what perspective we're viewing it, what font is it rendered in, what color is it, what's its contrast to the background. And that's just for text, but think about symbols. There's even more variability among symbols. So typically, the decoding process, going from a set of raw pixels to an identification of the character or the symbol there is extremely intensive computationally, much too slow to run in real time at video rates on a wide field of view image. And the field of view is large because as we move through the world, we wish to be aware of text everywhere in the environment, let's say nearly in a full sphere around us as we move. But look in this room. I mean, the text here only occupies a tiny fraction 
of our field of view, maybe 1% in this room, even with these pro uh, projection screens running. So the blind or visually impaired user doesn't know where to look in the text, where to aim the device. The device has to figure that out by itself, and that's a real challenge. So our approach is to capture both wide field and narrow field imagery, or so-called foveated imagery, with active control of a uh, longer lens camera to seek out the text. Here's a, an image in the middle of a wide field of view scene, a uh, hallway, with a little bit of text in the middle. We have some fast statistical tests to find the likely appearance of text, and then we point the high-res camera there, grab those pixels, and have enough information to decode the text there and only on the pixels where we think there is text. We can also integrate the text detection with the kind of 3D mapping and structure extraction that I showed you in the first part of the project. So for example, if we know that we're looking at a wall that is oblique and the text is going to be larger at one limb of the wall and smaller at the other end, well, we can rectify that imagery to be frontoparallel. And that makes life a lot easier for the text extraction methods, because now they can work with text that is roughly constant size rather than diminishing in size over the field of view. We can also incorporate spatial information. We have GPS. We have Wi-Fi-based localization. We know whether we're out on the street or at MIT walking in a corridor or at Shaw's supermarket or at the pharmacy. And we have this structural information that I just mentioned. So given that we have finite computational resources and always will, we have to use those resources in the most effective way. Where should we look? We should look where there's text most likely to be found. In a building like this, it's most likely to be found on vertical surfaces. It's most likely to be found at chest height. It makes much more sense to look there first before looking on the ceiling or looking on the floor. Text can be there sometimes, and we can look there if we have CPU left after we've looked in the more likely places. But we can organize the search by likelihood and by the absolute size of the text. So at the image on the lower right, you can see that uh, we should probably look first on the wall nearby at the left. Then maybe we should look at that faraway wall for large text and directional information. And only after that happens should we look on this much more oblique wall or on the ceiling and the floor, as I mentioned. So we can prioritize our use of resources in a, in a useful way. Let me show you a couple of clips about that. Here is the uh, spatial prioritization running. And it's of all these possible detections, it's saying, let's decode here. Let's spend our resources here, because this is probably the most likely place to find the text. And indeed, there is text there. We can also combine multiple observations. Rather than just taking one image and expecting it for text, we can take lots of images, fuse them together as we move through the world, and combine the decodings of the text on, from each of those images into one much more accurate decoding. So here's a, a clip of that happening as we walk toward that sign on the table. This may take a moment to start. It's a large video. As we walk toward the uh, sign on the table, the, Im the system captures multiple images of the sign and fuses them, but the video is refusing to play. Here we go. All right, and watch what happens. In the middle there, you see the, the text. It finds the biggest, closest letters first. Now it starts finding the letters from the, mil the middle of the words. And we've, we're slowing this down. I mean, this would happen as you walk toward the sign. But you can see how the system's actually reading these signs letter by letter and composing those different observations into one. And it turns out pretty accurate. It gets one letter wrong, but it says assistive tech le lecture, room 3297, by combining, I don't know what that was, 10 or 15 observations captured over a fraction of a second. I've told you a lot about how these devices can begin to capture relevant information about space, safe walking terrain, people, text, 
from the environment. I haven't said much yet about how to deliver that information to the user. We can certainly imagine delivering it through audio, and that's, that's something many people have done. And that is sometimes a perfectly reasonable thing to do. It's often not appropriate because people may be using their hearing for something else and they don't want their device talking to them. It could interrupt the conversation. It could distract them from something important. You could imagine delivering the information haptically through vibration or pressure. Again, sometimes an appropriate thing to do, but that is a very low bandwidth way to deliver information and it might simply not be rich enough to capture the complexity of what and who is around us in the world. So the fourth part of the project and the part that's led by my colleague Professor Livermore focuses on a new way of delivering information in a rapid way to the user, not through the ears, but through the skin and not through uh, a simple press or uh, vibration, but through an array, a high resolution array of vibrations. And I, Carol, could you come up please? And I'll, I'll hand it over to Carol now so she can continue, thank you. Thank you, I'm Carol Livermore from Northeastern. So what we're working on is providing information in a way that is timely, the user gets what they need, in a way that is private, and in a way that is discreet. Get it? Okay, that'll be better. There, how's that? Okay. So. As Seth mentioned, one of the options, of course, is to use an audio feed. But another option is to use text, and you might ask, why not use that? And of course, the reason is because not all information is easily conveyed as text. If what you need to know is where to walk, or how the map looks, or what kind of graphics are on the signs near you, or if you're a scientist or an engineer and you're trying to look at technical diagrams, the text is not the tool that you need. So our goal is to use a high-resolution tactile display as a means of conveying the information rapidly, uh, privately, and also in a way that's intuitive and takes advantage of how people uh, best re receive information. So first, a word or two about my background. Uh, one of my primary research focuses is small machines that do jobs that are uh, rather large for the small size of the tool being used. So I've got a couple pictures at the top here uh, that represent things like centimeter scale engines or energy harvesters or even rocket technologies. So small things, big jobs. The other thing that my research group focuses on is how to create small scale systems in ways that are manufacturable and scalable and are as easy as possible. For example, our techniques range from microfabrication to having systems that fold into their final configuration or even assemble themselves. So these kinds of technologies are directly applicable to the kinds of challenges that you have to face when you're dealing with uh, delivering information through a high resolution tactile display. Uh, We'll talk a little bit more in a moment about exactly how that is. But basically what we want is to be able to display not just static information, not just information on something that remains the same, for example, um, what's on a piece of paper, but on things that change as you walk around and your environment changes or as somebody approaches you. And what that means is you need to be able to have a display that updates very quickly and can also display a really rich variety of different kinds of information. So our approach to this is to use a combination of static patterns and also patterns that move underneath your fingers, so basically simulated motions. 
And I've got a couple examples here of how you might use that. Over on the left, imagine that you're a scientist or an engineer and you're trying to look at a graph. Well, that's straightforward enough. With a high resolution tactile display, you can take the pattern of the graph and put it directly onto your display where you can feel it with your fingers. Um, in the center, there's another example. You're trying to cross the street. You don't know whether it's a, uh, whether it's a walk signal or a don't walk signal. You could get your, your sensors can deliver the image of the little man crossing the street to your display. You can recognize what it is. And on the right is actually uh, perhaps a more interesting example. Imagine you walk into a meeting room and you want to return, you want to find an empty seat or return to the seat you occupied previously before you, you left. Uh, you can have the display tell you that. Imagine, for example, that the seat, the empty seat is off, is off to the left in that image. You can put your finger on the display and in the simplest case, feel the direction of an arrow. But more interestingly, you can put your fingers there and the display can actually actuate under your fingers. So the way the motion goes is the way that you will want to travel. And it's easier for humans to detect those kinds of moving stimuli than stationary ones. So that has the potential to make this a lot easier to use. Uh, that said, it's not easy. If it were easy, we'd already have it. Um, and it would be in wide use. The challenges are, for this kind of information, you really need a truly two-dimensional, full-page kind of display. You need high resolution and you need the ability to show moving patterns. There are certainly actuators that move quickly, like the ones in refreshable Braille, but they're too big. You can't make full 2D. There are also fully 2D displays, but they adjust themselves slowly. It also needs to be manufacturable at low cost. So our goal is basically to go from the kinds of large, expensive to put together devices like the Braille cell over on the left to the truly um, high resolution display. So our approach is shown schematically here. Instead of using piezoelectric actuators that bend and have to be pretty big, we use actuators that get longer and shorter. And that, uh, that getting longer and shorter in plane is converted to a vibration that you can feel um, by a scissor mechanism that rises up and down while the thing gets, while the actuators get longer and shorter in plane. Um, here are a couple of other images. Uh, you, you can see a view of these scissors on top of the actuators with pins sticking out the top through a cap plate. Um, on the bottom, you can actually see an image of one of these that has been implemented in my laboratory. That one is, is an upscaled version. It's about a centimeter long. But these are actually scalable down to length scales uh, more on the scale of a couple millimeters and areas on the order of a millimeter square. On the right-hand side, you can see the hardware while it's being assembled. So uh, this slide shows our initial 28-element prototype. It's a, you, can, um, you can try it. Basically, it's assembled by uh, using micro uh, manufactured parts put together by hand. Uh, and through this, you can feel the vibrations. Our next step is to work on turning this into a fully scalable um, microfabrication approach that would allow us to create at relatively low cost, a single layer of actuators that can give you this dense display of rapidly moving um, signals that you need to be able to detect motions and patterns and so forth. Do you want to finish up? Yeah, okay. Let's okay. So that brings our presentation to a close. Just to recap, we have collaborated with blind and visually impaired users. We've identified these four key functions the ability to move safely in the world, to know who's around you, to know what text and symbols are around you, and to have private access to that information so the whole world doesn't have to know what you know. We're pursuing a multidisciplinary effort to develop methods to solve these problems in the real world, not just in the lab, but out in the wild, as people say, 
for users moving around indoors, outdoors, really anywhere that anyone might wish to go by integrating sensing, 3D mapping, computational analysis, and interactive techniques. We've shown you some early prototypes of each function that we described, and we invite you to come to the exhibition at 1230, where we'll have all of these devices out in the hallway, and, we can, and the students will be here, and we can all chat about them. And we're working very hard to extend and evaluate these capabilities as we go, again, with the support of the foundation, for which we're very grateful. We're delighted to be at this workshop. Uh, we, we really seek collaboration, both with researchers who are trying to solve uh, similar and related problems, and also with users. So come to the exhibition, talk to us more, and we're uh, glad to have you. Thank you. Thank you. Should we take, do we have time, Laura, do we have some time for questions? If you have just small question, but um, there will be also a final discussion tonight at around 4.30. Can, can we take so a couple of questions from the audience? Yes. If there are any? Yes. Oh, the microphone is being requested. Why don't you take one of these? No, it's there. Oh, there it is. It's on okay. the floor. So uh, I really enjoyed the your presentation. The uh, with the mobility and mapping. Is there going to be an effort to uh, not only map what the camera is currently viewing, but build up a map of the 3D environment continuously, so you can know if there's an obstacle, even the, the to your left, for example, even if the camera is not viewing that. The question is whether the uh, mapping capability includes persistence over time so that upon passing by an obstacle or returning to the same location in space after a, a longer period, the system can know, in quotes, that there's a hazard there. And the answer is yes. That's actually SLAM, or simultaneous localization and mapping, is something we've wor worked on for many years as part of our robotics work. And there's a natural synergy between that capability and this one. Uh, there is a uh, there is a safety issue there in terms of relying on stale information. Of course, it's, it's, it's not so bad to warn the user about something that might be hazardous, but it's pretty bad to tell them that something's safe when it isn't. So I'm imagining the perhaps contrived example of a trap door opening in the floor. It does happen sometimes. It's rare, thankfully. But you wouldn't want to map the solid floor and then conclude that it's solid and then let somebody walk backwards over it or sideways over it. So there's a safety issue there, but absolutely yes, we do want to incorporate that kind of ability. And I can show some, some extensive um, spatial mapping results at the exhibition on, on my laptop, if you like. Other questions? Just one. Um, the system is based on the tactile Sens uh, sensitivity of the hand, no? Mm -hmm. You can imagine that uh, our front can be used uh, besides the hand in order to have uh, free hands. It would be possible to imagine to transfer the tactile sensation in the, fr the front? Um, absolutely it is. So you have Fantastic. a you have a different density of touch receptors yeah. in different parts of your body. So the larger area of your forehead, for example, doesn't necessarily correspond to, a l to proportionately larger amounts of information. Okay. But you could certainly do that, and in some ways it makes the engineering easier because, well, if your receptors are, wi are more widely spaced, mm. your actuators can be too without any real loss of information. Okay, thank you. Yes, and, though, and while no one's ready to do this experiment yet, we imagine someday that if you have, let's say, a baby who's congenitally blind, you could devote some large portion of their skin area to a display like this and give them a live feed of visual information from birth, uh, perhaps on the back or on the forehead. Again, not something we would want to do today or that anyone would let us do today, but someday it will be possible. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now, now we have the coffee break, and we'll start again at 10.30.